Forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can see clearly his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. Last week, we took a look at a couple of really, really cool things. We looked at how on one hand, God exists by his very definition. Now that's a kind of a hard thing to wrap our heads around that how can something exist by definition? Well, I'll explain a little bit what I mean. One plus one equals two, and that is true by definition. And that's because the word two means one on one. Therefore, one on one, one plus one equals two, and that's true by definition. The word reality kind of works the same way. Reality equals that which actually exists. So reality exists by definition. Reality equals that which actually exists. That which actually exists equals reality. That's something that's true by definition. Now all mathematics is based on this principle. Well, in the exact same way we saw that over 3,500 years ago, when the Bible was first written down, we see that the very first verse of the Bible, the word God is being defined as that which created the universe. That which created the universe equals God. That's what that word means. Now, through science and logic and mathematics, we know that something created the universe. Well, now that something is being given that name God. Now, there's a difference between knowing something created the universe and what that something is like. And so we looked a little bit deeper and we looked into the sciences of astronomy and physics and looked out just as the Bible encourages us to look at how the heavens declare the glory of God. So we took a look at our solar system, our galaxy, our galactic supercluster, Lania Kea that we belong to, the universe, just to see how crazy big it was. And we were able to bring out some, some logical deductions by looking at creation, what we could tell about the creator. When we looked at creation, we could see sort of God's fingerprints put there. And one of the things that we saw was that creation is big. It's very big. It's very, 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 very big. Uh, And so therefore, what created that had to be powerful. Very powerful. Very, 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 very powerful. Okay, so that's one thing we figured out. We also figured out that whatever created the universe, and we're giving it the name God, Whatever created the universe, it must be transcendent. That means it exists outside of the universe. Since the universe, including time and space, popped into existence, whatever caused that exists outside of it. Okay. We also found out that God was imminent because the very act of creating something demonstrates your ability to interact with it. So not only is God outside of creation, he also has the ability to interact with that which he's created. Okay, well the fourth thing, when we looked at the laws of physics for this, and we saw that the laws of physics are very, 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 very fine-tuned to allow for the existence of light. Like for example, we looked at gravity, and if gravity was a teeny, 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 teeny bit stronger, the universe would have collapsed in on itself as soon as it was created. And if it was a teeny, teeny, teeny bit weaker, No stars would have formed. The universe would just expand into a fine mist. No stars, no planets, no life. And we looked at the chance of that happening by random accident of just getting all those numbers exactly right to allow life to exist was like ridiculously impossible. Therefore, we concluded that whatever had fine-tuned the universe had done so deliberately and with a great deal of intelligence. We can see God's fingerprints and tell what a little bit of what God's like by looking at the creation. Well, today we're going to be looking at the discipline of biology. It's cool to know that God created the universe and created it to allow for life. But is life here on earth an accident? Can we tell to see if we look at the smallest cell and see God's fingerprints there? Well, how are we supposed to detect God's fingerprints? How can we reliably do that? How is it possible to tell if something's just a random act or if it's an intelligent action? How do you know that? Well, one of the things we looked at to help us figure out the difference between random and not random is we looked at a simple game of poker. Now, with the game of poker, 
the odds of you getting any specific hand, no matter what that hand is, but any specific hand is really remote, only one in 2.6 million. However, you get dealt a pair of threes, you're not thinking, oh my goodness, what are the odds? Well, the reason is, is because there's a difference between getting a specific hand and getting a type of hand. The chances of you getting a junk hand, like that just doesn't have no value, is about 50-50. The odds of you getting two pairs is about one in 20. The odds of you getting three of a kind is one in 46. And the odds of getting a royal flush is one in 650,000 against. So if we're playing cards and my pair of nines beat your, your pair of threes, okay, we've got no reason to worry about that. Yeah. But if I keep dealing myself royal flushes, you should be very suspicious because the odds of that happening are crazy remote. Now, if you're not suspicious about me dealing myself royal flushes, we need to play cards because <laughs> you're exactly the kind of person I want to play cards with. Okay, so we can tell just using basic math that, you know what, if something is really, really impossible for it to happen, it probably wasn't random. Well, same thing can happen in my house. I remember years ago, when my kids were shorter than me rather than taller than me, uh, they would go up to the computer keyboard and they would just sort of mash along. And I'd look on the computer screen and I would just see... Okay, that's just what would happen. Now, if I looked on the computer screen and didn't see that random mash, but instead saw, John, don't forget some milk, would it be wise of me to say, huh, that was just random chance. Uh, little kids did that. Well, only if I wanted to sleep on the couch. Uh, that's just not a rational thing to do. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to look inside the, the smallest and simplest form of life, the cell. And we're going to see, is there anything random there or is there any evidence of design? Now, a cell contains at least two major components and contains DNA and proteins around that DNA. Now that DNA, in case you forgot high school, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. What DNA actually is, is an information archive. In fact, it's the first non-human information storage device we ever, ever encountered. Uh, and it contains lots and lots of instructions on how to construct a cell. However, by itself, DNA is absolutely useless. Just like a cookbook without a cook, DNA isn't going to do anything. Just like a cookbook isn't going to make a meal for you, you actually need a real cook and real ingredients and then the cookbook. Uh, DNA is just the information. That's all it is. Now, the other side of the equation is the proteins. Now, here, these are the workers. But the proteins are useless without the DNA. Just like a clueless cook isn't going to be making anything without the cookbook, the proteins don't know what to make and they don't know how to make it without the DNA to tell them. So the very first cell that came into existence needed the simultaneous appearance of both the DNA and the proteins, both the cookbook and the cooks for life to ever exist. Well, how likely is that? What are the chances of that actually happening? Well, let's take a look at the most simple cells that we know of. And the most simple cells that are able to really survive on their own have a DNA that has 2,000 gene products in it. Those are the most simple cells. And what they're able to do is create proteins that can harvest the sunlight, turn that into energy, can take base elements and turn it into food. So they can do some pretty cool things. But I think we can do better than that. And we've done some research, and not only what are the most simple cells, but what are the most simple cells possible? So what we've been doing is taking shots at those simple cells' DNAs, disabling gene after gene after gene to see how much gene we can destroy and still have something that's barely alive. And one of the things that we've been able to do is reduce one of these 2,000 gene product sequences long and get a cell that only had 183 gene products in it that was still alive. Now, barely alive and on life support, and it ain't harvesting sunlight or anything cool like that anymore, but still limping along. 
okay, that each gene product has about one kilobyte of information in it. So that most simple survivable cell that we were able to create, the theoretical most simple form of life, has a DNA sequence that is 160,000 sequences long. What's the chance of that coming together by chance? All right, well, let's sort of perform a little experiment. Well, we're going to have these 160,000 long DNA strands, and we're just going to sort of randomly sort of spin the dials on them and to see if we can get some kind of combination that works. All right, how many in our little experiment, how many DNA strands do we have to work with? Hundreds, thousands, millions? Well, scientists believe that the size of the whole universe, it contains 10 to the 80 atoms in it. So that's a one followed by 80 zeros. Like that's a lot of atoms. Okay, well, what if the universe is bigger than that? Maybe we're wrong. Well, let's say for our experiment, we don't have 10 to the 80 atoms, but 10 to the 100 DNA strands exactly the right length. So we're gonna see if we can spin the combinations and get something that works from big long list of DNA. All right, how much time do we have to work with? Well, most scientists believe that the Earth is about six, not the Earth, the universe, is 16.8 billion years old. Converting that into seconds, that's 10 to the 17 seconds. So one with 17 zeros, seconds have elapsed since the creation of the universe. Well, let's say the universe is older than that. Maybe trillions of times older than that. Quintillion times older than that. Let's say the universe is not 10 to the 17 seconds, but 10 to the 100 seconds old. So we're saying the universe is crazy old. So we've got a huge number of these random DNA strands and over a vast, vast, vast amount of time. Well, let's say one of these DNA strands, if they don't get a right combination, they, they get a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. And let's say that each of those DNA strands are mutating 10 to the 100 times every second, like way faster than the speed of light. So they're all trying to find the right combination. And so we've got more DNA strands than we have atoms in the universe for way longer than the universe existed, moving faster than the speed of light to randomly try to find a right combination. Well, how many possible right combinations are there? Well, there could be millions, maybe trillions. Well, let's say there's 10 to the 100 possible right combinations that we can possibly get. All right, I think I'm being more than fair here. Uh, I'm really giving this, these guys a chance to get at least one DNA strand that works. So we've got 10 to the 100 DNA strands mutating faster than the speed of light for far longer than the universe existed to get only one of 10 to the 100 possible right answers. What are the odds of that happening even when I really rigged the system? Well, the odds of that rigged system working is only one in 10 to the 95,000. If I was gonna write out the odds of that against, I'd be writing zeros from here to Calgary. Um, it's completely and utterly impossible to get even one, even when I rig the system. Um, you're never, ever, ever, it's mathematically impossible to randomly get a DNA strand that actually works. Just like it is mathematically impossible for my three-year-old to mash it on the keyboard and produce Shakespeare. Ain't gonna happen. All right. Well, that's the DNA. That's only part of the equation. What about the protein side? Well, proteins are a lot simpler and it's a lot easier to get one of those right. We're gonna take a look at a protein called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C only has 110 amino acids in it not 160,000, 110. Uh, and any of those amino acids could be one of 20 different amino acids. Well, if we're randomly creating proteins and just throwing amino acids together, uh, say one every second uh, from the assembles of, of amino acids, is it possible that we could get a cytochrome C? Well, what we would need to do is cover the entire planet with an ocean of amino acids. And that's probably still not gonna be enough. Let's make sure that there are Earth-like planets covered in oceans of amino acids around every single star in the galaxy, 
in every single galaxy in the universe. So there are billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon quadrillions of planets covered in amino acids trying to put this together. And let's say they were doing this right from the beginning of the universe 16.8 billion years ago. Could we randomly, given oceans of amino acids constantly coming together, get just one cytochrome C molecule? The answer is no. <laughs> uh, we could if the universe wasn't 16.8 billion years old, but if it was 229 octodictelian times older than that, <laughs> that is the age of our universe wow. times 229 with 57 zeros after. Wow. Then we could get one protein. Wow. All right, the odds of this happen thing are just ridiculous. That's not going to happen by chance. You've got far more chance of a tornado hitting a junkyard and creating 747s than that <laughs> happening. It just is a mathematical <laughs> impossibility. But there's a, a visual way to, I think, to understand what I'm talking about. Now imagine you're out on a walk on a beach. Now I'm walking on a beach and I see sand. I shouldn't think anything of it. You know, just sand. But if I'm walking along the beach and I see a sand castle, I would have to be a very special kind of stupid to think that, well, random action of wind and waves created sand castles. <laughs> No, I mean, you see a sandcastle, you know somebody put it there. It's not, it's not random. Well, what if I'm walking along the beach and I don't see a sandcastle, but I see a robot? Now, it's possible that bits of iron ore could wash down from the mountains and into the ocean. It's possible that bits of iron ore in the ocean could swirl around and end up at a volcanic vent and melt. It's possible that different bits of ore could mingle with each other and get washed back up on the shore. But if you see a robot on the shore and you're thinking, huh, that's just random action? Come on. Nobody's going to do that. Okay, but what if that robot gets up? What if that robot starts mining for more ore, starts building solar cells, starts building other machines and assembling a factory that starts producing other robots? What would we think then? Well, there's no nation or corporation on our entire planet that can create autonomous self-replicating machines. If we saw a robot such as that, logically we would be put in a very, very uncomfortable position. And that is nothing on earth created that robot. And that we as humans are not the smartest actors on this stage. Well, in our human technology, one of the, the cutting edges of technology that we're involved in is something called nanotechnology. Now, nanotechnology is taking machines and trying to build them smaller and smaller and smaller and building microscopic machines. Now, we're not very good at this yet. Um, we're actually pretty bad at it. But we're hoping to be good at it someday. And if we can, the possible medical advances and technological man manufacturing advances, I mean, they're limitless. So many cool things could happen if we can master this nanotechnology. But what if we go into the realm of nanotechnology and find that somebody else has beaten us to it and has created machines far, far, far more advanced than what we can? Well, that's what's happened inside the cell. Somebody has beat us. Now, I'm going to show you a video here that's going to blow your mind. Now, I've been talking about proteins, and people have heard about proteins in a whole bunch of different classes we took in school, but we don't know what proteins really are. To find out what a protein is, we can go deep inside the cell, and inside the cell, we find factories and machines and monorail transportation systems inside there. It's far more complicated than we've ever imagined. Now, inside the cell, just like a, a modern city, you need to get machine parts and machinery and fuel from one cell to the part of the cell to the other. And to hopefully that things will just randomly float around isn't very efficient. So what our cells actually have is a built-in monorail system. These monorails are called microtubules. And these are self-assembling highways that connect different parts of the cell to the other part. Now, if there's any civil engineers here, I'm, I'm sure you would wish that, boy, it would be nice if we could create self-assembling highways. But that technology is quite a bit beyond what we can pull off. But these things are really cool. 
And along these monorails are these special machines, these proteins called kinesins. Now this is a kinesin right here. Now what you're seeing is it moving by its globular heads. Now I hate globular heads. Uh, they look like feet to me, so I'm not going to call them feet, not heads. But the feet of the kinesin molecule, the way they work is they molecularly bond to the highway one at a time to move forward. And they're powered by these rechargeable batteries called ATP molecules. Now, even when these things are moving along, if they get stuck and they carry this huge cargo behind them, and they're strong little guys because that cargo weighs way more and is way larger than that skinny little machine that's pulling it. But if it gets stuck, just like a modern railroad, you can get multiple engines to pull a very large chain, train. What kinesin will do is it will call its buddies along and you'll get multiple kinesin molecules uh, pulling along the cargo. It's just utterly incredible. I, I never learned anything like that in high school. Now, this video, just letting you know, it slowed things way, way, way down so you can see what's happening. Those things actually move 100 times faster than that and will take 100 steps every second. The kinesin motorized transportation machines also have the ability, just like your computer, to turn into hibernate mode and store energy until they're used later. Uh, not only do they transport cargo throughout the cell, but they're also used in cell division and cell multiplication. They are like incredibly cool machines. And they're only one type of robotic machine that you find in every one of your 40 trillion cells in your body. Uh, they're just utterly amazing. And to assume that robots like this just pop into existence, isn't particularly reasonable. Now, you know when I talked about those machines and how they have those batteries? Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the battery chargers. The battery chargers here are special met power plants within the cell that recharge your batteries. And they don't take a few hours like our battery charges. They happen just about like that. If you go, again, deep inside the cell, you'll find these special manufacturing plants uh, manufacturing power plants called mitochondria. Now the mitochondria are like way, way, way bigger and far, far more complex than that little kinesin motor that you saw. But if you go deep inside the mitochondria, you're gonna find these little power plants, plants that are embedded in its sort of outer layers. And there they are. Uh, you see that rotating turbine? That's the power plant. That's ATP synthase. And what ATP synthase does is it takes used batteries that are out of energy called ADP and recharges them, and turns them into ATP and sends them back out into the cell so different machines can use those batteries. The beating heart of ATP synthase is an acid-driven rotary engine. It works at an efficiency far beyond any of the machines that we can make in converting energy into motion. Uh, they're actually incredible. The rotary engine rotates a drive shaft. Attached to the drive shaft is a cam, and the cam will open up these protein subunits at the bottom uh, of the machine. What those things do is they have docking ports in them for the used batteries. So these ADP batteries used Oh, go into there, they close, they get recharged by attaching a phosphate group to them. And then you've got your fully charged ATP batteries that are released into the cell. And this happens all the time, giving us tons and tons of energy. Now in special cells like muscle cells that need a lot of energy, man, there are crazy, crazy thousands and thousands of these things in there. Uh, but they're the power plant within the cell. Now, as human engineers, we recognize these parts. We build things that we have rotary engines, we have drive shafts, we have cams, um, we have stators. So we recognize many of the components here. Though we don't understand how everything in here works, it's a little bit beyond our technology, but we recognize this as a piece of advanced technology. Well, if you're walking on the street and you see a rotary engine uh, or an instant battery charger, you're gonna assume that some engineer designed that. However, we get really, really uncomfortable when we look inside the cell and we see something far more complicated and advanced than we can build. And then we're very uncomfortable thought that means there's an engineer far smarter than we are. Yeah. But the things get cooler than that. Let me tell you 
about one of the ways DNA works. Now I talked a little bit about before about how DNA is an information archive. It's a huge information archive. Um, one of its roles is to contain that information to tell us how to build new proteins. And I'm going to show you how that happens. First, the DNA needs to be uncoiled by a librarian machine. So it's tightly coiled. It needs to find the right spot in that sequence to get the instructions. Then something called a polymerase will unzip the DNA and will make a photocopy called, uh, that's called messenger RNA. And it'll create this photocopy called a transcript. And it will spit out that photocopy of that section of DNA, just like that. And it will move from the DNA to the outer part of the nucleus, where it approaches a special information recognition machine um, called the nuclear pore complex. Nuclear pore complex controls the flow of information inside and outside of the nucleus of the cell. And it's designed to recognize, oh right, messenger RNA, head on out there. Once the transcript exits the nucleus, it will enter into a manufacturing plant called a ribosome. A ribosome is this two-part manufacturing plant that will take the transcript and will read it bit by bit and use it to step-by-step step construct a machine uh, called a protein. Now those little workers that you see that are going in here, uh, those are called transfer RNAs. And they will grab machine parts from all over the cell. They'll come in, the ribosome tells them how, what order to put things in, and they will manufacture a big long string called a protein. Now that protein, you'll see it being spit out at the bottom of this ribosome. The protein does something super cool. It's just like transformers. It comes out as a long string and then it will fold itself and assemble itself into a machine. Some are a little bit too complicated to do that. So they'll have these molecules, transportation molecules called chaperones. They'll take them inside this structure. This is called a chaperonin and it will fold the protein into the right shape. Now the animation doesn't really show that. And that's because we don't actually know how these things work. Uh, we know that unfolded proteins go in, folded proteins come out. How that machine works is beyond us. But when it's done, it creates this protein molecular machine and sends it out into the rest of the cell so it can do its job. See, 150 years ago, when Darwin created some of his theories and thought that maybe life just emerged out of a warm pond by accident, they thought that the cell was just a simple bag of jello. Now cut Darwin some slack. The guy lived in the age of muskets and wooden sailing ships. He didn't have access to a lot of technology that we have. But what we found is that the cell is not just a bag of jello. A cell is actually a complicated roboticized city with monorail transportation systems, manufacturing plants, power plants, assembly plants, assembly lines, workers. It's far, far, far more complicated than we ever dreamed. And the chances of that just simply popping into existence, quite frankly, everybody knows that's just not realistic. It's interesting to note that the most celebrated atheist of our time, Richard Dawkins, defines his own scientific discipline like this. He says, Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. The appearance of being designed for a purpose? You think? The thing is, no matter who you are and what you believe, that appearance of design is impossible to get away from. I did a little bit of a, of a search and I started looking up these different terms. One, I looked up evolutionary purpose. I got 69,000 results. I looked up evolutionary strategy and I got 146,000 results. I looked up the phrase evolutionary design and I got 278,000 results. You know what? People just can't resist this kind of language because they see strategy and design and purpose whenever they look. However, I've got a news flash for you. Random processes don't have strategies. Random processes don't have designs and random processes don't have purposes. There's only one thing in our entire universe that has purposes, strategies, and designs, and that is an intelligent mind. That is what we see. That's funny. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, 
For ever the, since the world was created, people have seen the earth in the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yet claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious ever-lifting God, they traded the truth of God for a lie. I want you to open your mind to a possibility. The possibility that you are not the random product of pus and scum. <laughs> the possibility that life has meaning because life has an author. The possibility that your life has a purpose because you were created on purpose for a purpose. I want you to open your mind that that could be real, that the reason that you're here today is because you were meant to be. You see, we can look at the facts and the reason and the logic, and yeah, you know what, we can see lots of good evidence that, you know what, somebody's been messing around with our planet uh, and things have been designed on purpose. But you know what, when we look inside our own hearts, there's a very special piece of knowledge there, and it doesn't matter what you believe, uh, but it's inescapable and it haunts us. And that piece of knowledge is that there's something actually wrong with the world. I don't care, I used to be an atheist, I was an atheist for years, but I still knew that the war, the rape, the destruction, the cruelty on our planet, there's something deep inside that I knew that it's not supposed to be this way. And while logically as an atheist, if you're like right and wrong, those are arbitrary human concepts. They don't really matter. They don't really count. They're impossible. That the value of one thing or another, that's arbitrary as well. But deep inside my heart, I knew, you know what? There's still something wrong here. And this knowledge that there's something wrong with our world completely contradicts the way we normally think. Normally, we as humans, what our usual experience is, is the way things are supposed to be. Uh, sometimes you hear people who pronounce the word foyer as foyer. Now, I don't know if you're a foyer person or you're a foyer person, but when you hear the other person talk, what does it sound like to you? It sounds not different. It sounds wrong. <laughs> Have you ever had somebody else load the dishwasher? <laughs> do they do it differently or do they do it wrong? <laughs> All right, that's our human nature is our experience defines what is right. Yet this flies in the face of that because it doesn't matter what your experience is. We know that it wasn't supposed to be this way. And deeper yet, on those rare occasions when we have a moment of honesty in the mirror, we realize that I wasn't supposed to be this way. See, we as people, we are absolute ninjas at dodging responsibility and deflecting blame. Every crisis, every problem in my life is somebody else's fault, not my fault. I couldn't help it. I can blame everything. We're good at that. But every once in a while, it sneaks up on us and we look in the mirror and we realize, you know what? I'm not the man I should be. I'm not the husband that I should be. I'm not the father. I'm not the son that I should be. We realize that not only is the world not the way it's supposed to be, but we're not the way we're supposed to be. In our hearts, we have regrets. We know there's things that we're ashamed of. There's things about our life that we'd rather not have other people know. There's thoughts that we think that we would rather not express. All of us have had moments where, you know, We've been confronted with the right thing and the right choice and we failed to do the right thing. We all know that deep, deep within our hearts that there's something inherently wrong with us. And if there was a grand purpose, whoever had this grand purpose of how the way things were supposed to be cannot possibly be happy with this world and cannot be possibly happy with me. We can identify with that phrase written down 3,000 years ago, what is man that thou art mindful of him? We feel that weight. We feel that condemnation. We know that even if God has had a path for us, man, we've rejected that. We've been doing things our own way. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that this 
great God who created the universe actually entered into it. He became one of us. He lived as one of us. He walked with us. He talked with us. He shared with us. He lived with us. And he died with us. And what the Bible says is that, yeah, every single one of us, no perfect people, every single one of us is screwed up. Every single one of us has broken God's laws. Every one of us are criminals in God's sight. And all of us are deserving of divine punishment. But what God did is the punishment that I deserve, the punishment that you deserve, no matter what you've done, he took that and he nailed that to the hands of his innocent son. That Jesus died on that cross instead of us. But you know what? The gospel doesn't end with a cross. Because Jesus did not just die instead of us. He rose again from the grave. And he offers that new life. That the corrupt life I've been living, I can exchange that for a new life with him. That God doesn't have to be this theoretical entity a million miles away. God can be somebody that I know personally and who can transform me personally. That the creator who made me is the same creator who can heal me. The creator who called me to live a better life has the power to enable me to live that better life. I'm going to lead you through a prayer right now that it's going to allow you to lay hold of that. A prayer that's going to allow you to turn from doing things your way to doing things God's way. To be able to take your life, no matter what your broken dreams are, what your wounds are, to take all your brokenness and put them into the hands of your loving creator where he can make you whole. If you pray this prayer with all your heart and not pray to me, pray to God, I guarantee this theoretical God from a million miles away is gonna come and know you and he's gonna change you and transform you. Everybody please bow your head and just pray after me. Dear God, I know I've messed up. I've done things my own way. I've followed my own path. I've failed to follow you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Take my life. Take my hopes. Take my dreams. Make me into something new. Save me. Heal me. Fill me. Use me. Amen.